Hello. We are going to talk to you about empowering students to access supports in asynchronous delivery. I am Barbara Fichtel. Um, I'm here because I wanted to share a survey, survey information that we collected during an online class. And there you see my email. Hi everyone, I'm Karen Hager and I also have my email there. And I'm here because honestly, this is what we spend most of our time thinking about. We have students across the state of Utah typically, and so we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what's the best way to deliver high quality instruction to students who are not physically on campus. So what we're going to share with you today, the outline of our presentation, is a little overview of the program Karen was just referring to. Then we'll talk about some results of the survey that we took this summer and some future directions we would like to go. So as Barb said, we did a survey and we were looking to get some feedback from students on some of the um, different formats that we use to deliver instruction. So we thought it'd be helpful to have a bit of a context of what this program is. So the program that the students who participated in this survey enrolled in is the online practical teacher training. It's a little bit of a mouthful, so we call it OPT because we want people to opt in for special education. And what we do is provide special education licensure to individuals who want to be preschool special education teachers, who want to be K-12 um, teachers for students who are K-12 who have severe disabilities, and then also teachers in the K-12 system for students who have mild to moderate disabilities. Pretty much all of the students in our program are what we think of as non-traditional. Um, so they're usually older than typically, you know, kind of the on-campus undergraduate student age. In order to be accepted into the program, they have to be working as a special education paraprofessional, which is a teacher's aide, or a special education teacher. The teachers are in the program because they're not yet qualified to actually be teachers, but because we have such a shortage, districts can hire individuals um, and not, they're not yet qualified to be teachers, but the contingency is that they have a time frame in which they have to get licensed to teach. And so that's really who this program was developed for. It's all web delivered, and so we use a kind of a mixture of synchronous and asynchronous course delivery, and that's kind of what led to the survey that Barb will talk a little bit more about um, in a minute. But let me tell you who was in the survey first. So this is the first cohort of this program, of the OPT program, but really in our department for probably 25 years or so, we've had similar programs. Um, and what we did is kind of redesigned and brought everybody together kind of under one umbrella. So we're considering this the, the first cohort of this newly redesigned program. And we invited all of the students who were in the summer class to participate in the survey. There were 36 students enrolled in the class and 32 of them responded to the survey. We created the survey in Qualtrics and that's how we distributed it to the students. It was anonymous and we just posted the link in Canvas and said, please complete the survey. And because we have um, really cooperative students, nearly all of them did. We did offer five points of extra credit because students love extra credit. It's usually the students who don't actually need extra credit, right? I love the extra credit most. But we gave them five points of extra credit for submitting it. And because it was anonymous, they got the five points by just um, posting in the campus that they had submitted the survey. So Barb's going to tell you a little bit about what was actually on the survey. So it was a fairly short survey that we set up in Qualtrics. And we asked them to rate the effectiveness and their preference for different content delivery modes that we had mixed in to all the different units in the online asynchronous class. Um, they also asked, we also asked them for some feedback. So for example, we asked them to rate effectiveness from one to five, five being the most effective for them, and um, the same with preferences. And then we asked them to give us some narrative explanation. So for example, if they rated it a four or five, we said, tell us why you really liked this one or why it was so effective for you. Um, if you rated three or below, we asked them to tell us why it didn't work for you. And we asked that for all of these different modes here. Um, Nearpod, which is a narrated PowerPoint, and Karen's gonna give a little, a lot more explanation on that in a minute, but it's a narrated PowerPoint lecture. Text-based journal articles or chapters, 
um, videos, uh, online modules. So these were modules that um, were produced by different agencies or other um, um, uh, facilities that provide different content modules. We have application assignments in each unit, and then there were reading responses, which we call reading responses, but they're actually essay uh, questions that kind of synthesized all the information from all those other modes, and so that, to help them pull the whole piece of that unit together. So we have effectiveness and preferences, plus comments on all of those six modes of delivery. Okay, I lost my cursor. There we go. So you want to go through the scale then, Barb? Sure. So the effectiveness scale, what we did, so for example, so as you see here, it was a one to five rating. One, do, do not learn well in this mode, all the way up to five, very easily learn this way. So we had two different kinds of the Nearpod lectures that um, we'll explain a little bit more about in a minute. But the Nearpod narrated PowerPoint. So those might have been small chunks of content that uh, covered just one particular topic. And the students were to watch that as part of the unit. Those were ranked across the 32 uh, students at 4.55, so pretty high. We also, um, in most units, we found as, as you go through that there are certain topics that everybody's having a little bit of struggling with. And so then we would narrate an extra power, an extra Nearpod that was more a follow up, a clarification of just particular items in that unit that students struggled with. They weren't necessarily required to watch this, but for those rather than all their feedback coming in a written format, this was a way to give them some feedback and clarify um, once again in a narrated lecture. Uh, th those were ranked second, uh, so 4.16. Video clips that they watched, 4.110. Application assignments, 4.0. Online modules, so those had some text based and some videos, and they had to follow some different, um, uh, uh, the different organization of the different agencies, was 3.77. Reading responses, were less. And unfortunately, Karen and I were both saying that the text based material, so the journal articles, were ranked 3.13. So, really, just under May struggle, but usually learn is how they're rating those um, articles that they read. And from the general comments that you can see from students, uh, most of what they said was that, oh, some were too technical and some were too long. And so it's really just that whole fact of reading, I believe. It was a little hard because I think one of them said that it was an old fashioned way <laughs> to get information. Yeah. Yes, it's kind of, yeah, it's like, oh, who still reads? <laughs> so, anyway, that's I what do. they said. I still read. So, that's what they said for those. So, that's the effectiveness of the mode. And then the second thing that we asked was their, their preference for the mode, which at one point, and we will dig deeper at looking at our data, um, but it can be quite effective, but they still may not like it. So um, that's why we asked both of those things. So it was the same kind of scale, one to five. One, I don't prefer this at all, and five, I do prefer this the most. And as you can see there, the Nearpod came out on the top again, 4.3. As a matter of fact, every mode came out mm -hmm. in the same order as it did in the effectiveness. Now I will say, but as you can see, there are fewer of these rated in the fours. The only one that was rated as a four, um, even though it's in the same order, was the, near, the Nearpod lecture. Um, the rest of them, and actually text-based, so the preference for reading was not even to the middle of prefer about the same as the other. So it was prefer a little. So um, same order once again, but actually it seems that the numbers get a little bit closer together in their preference for the modes. Okay, so we know that everyone may not be familiar with Nearpad. We were not familiar with it until just a couple of years ago. So we thought we'd go through a little bit of what exactly it is and show you a little demo because I think it's one of these times where a picture is worth a thousand words. So we'll do a, a short little one just to show you how it works. 
I am so sorry. I thought we were on the next one. No, that's fine. You can see, and, and just stay there. I think we're still fine. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about why they preferred it. And then Karen's going to go ahead and show you, give you the demonstration um, because you're probably going, well, what, what the heck is it? So um, these were some of the, we, we selected some of the comments. And, and it was interesting as I went through all the comments of prefer and not prefer, um, as the modes go down, whether where they preferred them less, um, there were more comments about why they didn't and fewer about why they liked them. Whereas the ones they really liked, they had two and three pages of comments why they liked them and only a couple about why they didn't. But the ones why they preferred the Nearpod lecture is it said you can go at your own pace through the slides and they aren't super long. We wanted to point out some of these things because as Karen shows you the demonstration, it's why it's probably effective for these online students. Um, it's similar to learning in class, one student said, but I can take notes at my own play, pace and replay the audio if I need to. And then it said most Nearpods have a nice balance of audio, video clips, slides, quizzes, open-ended questions. So they also like the variety. And now Karen's going to set up and give you the demonstration so you can see what they're referring to here. And just that quick follow-up on the can take notes at my own pace pace and replay the audio. Uh, because of the way it integrates with Canvas, I can tell when students have gone back into it. And there's a huge uptake right before a quiz or an exam that I can see they have gone back through them. So I think that's great. You can, can actually kind of document that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Barb kind of alluded to this, but what Nearpod does is it allows you to create interactive recorded lectures. So for years, I used to go to people like the instructional designers and say, is there something that I can use to make a recording for students that are going to watch it asynchronously and have them be able to kind of be engaged and, and have response opportunities built right into it instead of like on a separate worksheet or something like that. And they'd all say, oh, wow, yeah, that'd be really nice. But no, there isn't anything like that. But finally, a couple of years ago, we did find something like that. And it's this uh, product called Nearpod. So it has a number of features that I think are really useful. Um, one is slide-by-slide -slide narration. So what that means is instead of doing maybe a longer recording, maybe you're going to have a 20 or even 30 minute recording, which you shouldn't go that long anyway, but many of us uh, seems like do. So if you make a mistake in it somewhere or something happens, you've got to re-record that entire 20 minute segment, which is frustrating. Or if something changes, like you had a date in it from one semester and you need to change it to another semester you'd have to re-record the whole thing. And because this is slide by slide, it's really easy to, to fix things like that, to do editing or to just change something um, kind of on the fly because you can do it for each slide. So it's usually just a minute or two's worth of recording. You can also embed videos, like if you use YouTube videos or other videos, you can embed those right in this. Um, PDF documents, um, any other kind of documents that you want the students to access while they're doing it, those can be embedded right into it. And then what was really the kicker for me is this um, embedded response opportunities. This is what I was really looking for. And it gives you a number of different ways to do that. So you can do multiple choice questions, you can do true false, matching. I can't really explain this, but my students particularly love the matching questions. Um, I guess it just makes it more of a game. I don't know what it is, but I always get a really positive um, response to that. They have one called draw it where if you need them to circle something or you know maybe you need them to draw a model or work out some kind of a problem they can actually do that on the screen. Um, short answer kind of essay type questions. There have some other ones because they keep adding different types but these are probably the ones that are used most frequently and then you can even actually get a report um, that has everyone's response to each question which is kind of nice to to look at it, you can look at it student by student, but you can also look at a report with all of them. So it's got some nice features from the instructor's point of view. It also seems to be really um, kind of positively received by students. So we're gonna show you a little demo here, at least I think we are, we're gonna give this a shot. And just show you, I made a really short one, it's just three or four slides, and, and certainly when you did a, if I do a real one for my class, it has a little more content in it, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what it looks like. So let me see if I can stop this share and start a different one. Okay, so this is what it looks like when it's in Canvas. I made a little demo that took in just a few slides. 
and I put it in my Canvas course, which is exactly how students enter it. So they would just go to an assignment like they always do, type in their name and say they want to join the session. And then as you can see down here at the bottom, the little button that shows you there's a recording there. On the next slide, we are going to identify a few reasons that you might want to attend the ETE conference. And then for a couple of slides after that, there'll be some response opportunities and we'll demonstrate the quiz options in Nearpod. Okay, so that was the first slide. It actually went on a little bit quicker than I intended. So I'm still talking over that a little bit. So sorry about that. But they just click on that button for each one to get their recording. They can listen to it again or we can go on to the next one, which is what we're going to do. Now click at the recording at the bottom again. There are many reasons to attend the ETE conference. So we're gonna highlight just three of them here and we're gonna do that so that we have an excuse to ask you some questions about this content. And that will give us the opportunity to demonstrate some of the quiz options that are available in Nearpod. So you would certainly wanna to attend to learn innovative teaching strategies. One of the things the conference is known for is sessions that highlight a particular research-based teaching strategy that you may wanna use in your own classroom. You'll have the opportunity to network with your USU colleagues, faculty attend this conference, graduate students attend, teaching assistants, so you'll be able to network with a variety of your USU colleagues. And also we'll have an excellent keynote presentation by Dr. Villanueva on accessible and inclusive learning. Okay, so usually there'd be, you know, a few slides of content and then however often you want, you can put in a response. So I put in a couple of response slides next. So the first one says reasons to attend the ETE conference, select all that apply. Um, these are already selected. Definitely want to get in on that bonus you're going to get, right? We're going to each one. Then you click after you read through all the responses and make your answer, you click next. There's one more question. Um, only faculty attend, so that's false. And then I can submit my answers. And then if you set it up this way, I always have it so that the students find out right away if they got them correct or not. So it looks like I, it wasn't awesome. There was, I got about half of them right. But I actually want to look then, I can click on my answers and I can see that uh, learning innovative teaching strategies, I got that right and attending the keynote on accessible inclusive learning, I did that right. Um, apparently there is no $50 bonus, so I apologize for spreading that rumor. Um, and I should have clicked, um, I shouldn't have clicked um, network with colleagues from the K-12 school system because of course they wouldn't um, be as part of this. And then the last one, um, it is false that only faculty attend. So right away you can make, you can choose to have them see the correct answers or not. I always think it's helpful for them to get that feedback right away. And then this is the infamous uh, matching one that my students always love. Let's see, the keynote speaker would be Dr. Villanueva. Um, conference location is on the USU campuses and the faculty, I know that they are conference attendees. I did much better on that one, didn't I? I got all of them correct there. So that's, um, and then usually I didn't put a final slide on here, but I usually put some kind of a thanks for, thanks for listening slide at the end there. So I'm going to stop the share and go back to our original PowerPoint. And I'm going to remember to share it. There we go. I think we're back. So that's kind of a quick run through of what Nearpod looks like. And Bob's going to talk a little bit more about the student responses. I know I'm muted. Sorry. So we focused only since we had 20, 25 minutes, we decided not to go through all the other modes, but we do have that data. But since we focused on Nearpod, we thought we'd also give you some of the comments for the students who do not prefer that mode as much. So um, uh, this slide seemed to get, seemed to sum up most of what the do not prefer Nearpod showed. And they said that watching a slide with commentary is difficult for me to pay attention to. I can read slides. 
if there's other information given that is not on the slide, it is better. So what we were saying, what we we're thinking that this student told us about future Nearpods that we create um, for our um, fall classes is that we should have maybe less content for them to read if we're going to con get, go over that briefly and then in, um, in, go on with other information and dig deeper on some of that content because then the student has time to pay attention. So part of what they're saying is that between reading all the words or if we're reading all the words that doesn't add anything and so that we should briefly go over the content and then add more content once the reading is over so they can pay attention yeah and I think that kind of goes to good use of um, PowerPoint yeah. in general right because I think most of us um, kind of want to take a little take a little breather if we see somebody putting up lots and lots of text and just reading to us and yeah I, I kind of see the point we can all <laughs> Most of us can just read the slides. So I think the same thing definitely applies here. So as Barb said, we had a lot of other information, um, but given the shortness of the time here, uh, we thought it made sense to focus on what the students had the highest preference for and what they felt helped them the best to learn. And so kind of the big takeaway for us is that this really was a positive thing when we added this way of giving recorded lectures that had embedded opportunities to respond or we could use those in our asynchronous classes. Um, kind of anecdotally, I've had students often tell me that they feel like it, it kind of makes them attend, that they really need that kind of forced engagement and active engagement because then they are going to pay more attention and it just makes it more interesting to them to kind of have to have those response opportunities. And when I create them, I kind of think of it as the same way when I'm doing a, a live class of when I would ask a, the class a question or call on somebody or have a little, you know, discussion or something, try to embed those opportunities in the same way. So it's kind of taking one of the things that we think is a, a really positive feature of the synchronous or live interaction and putting it into this format that we know is often more accessible for students um, because it's easier for them if they don't have to be in a particular time and place for class. Uh, but again, we really always try to focus on having very high quality instruction in that setting too. And this is one way that we found helpful. Barb, do you have anything to add to that? No, nope, I don't think so. I think you covered it really well. Well, in that case, thanks for listening, everyone. Um, again, we have more information and we're going to kind of dig through it and probably write something up with it. But you can certainly get in touch with either of us at our emails there with any mm -hmm. questions or comments if you're using Nearpod or if you have some other um, really great uh, tool or strategy for making asynchronous, in particular, classes more interactive. We would love to hear about it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.